first thing I'd like to do is introduce Dan Kamen, who is on your screen, who is going to take us on this ride. And first, he's going to talk a little bit about housekeeping, and then we take off. Dan? Hi. Hello, everybody. Nice to have you joining us. I'm looking to see if I can read your names on my laptop, which is a little far away. And are, are, you, are you by your own names? Bob, you are Bob. And Chris, you are Chris. Just nod. And, and Michael, uh, you are Michael. And I, uh, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Kamen. We're going to uh, have a little talk among ourselves uh, about uh, how this, the, the theme of this weekend seems to be circus. And uh, how many of you watched the circus parade film? just now, as you were supposed to do. Um, not, not you yet, Bob, eh? Um, I'm glad you guys did. I, that makes, uh, I think, four of us who have seen it. Probably Sam has watched it as well. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a fascinating little film discovered in 1902 uh, of a circus parade right down the main street of Indianapolis, Indiana, which uh, has been restored by the Niles s &A Silent Film Museum. Uh, which is the kind donor of my background. Uh, this, uh, these are films, it's a montage of films, it's actually a blanket, and it's not virtual, it's a montage of uh, <laughs> poster and uh, scenes from uh, Niles, California in 1913. I usually don't show people the, the beautiful Esne uh, thing on the top, but here it's appropriate, it's a little more distracting. Um, because it's so beautiful. SNA's posters were the best in the business. And these are uh, shots from mostly the film The Champion, which is being advertised on the poster. Um, the, the thing I found notable about the, the circus parade film is uh, that there was not a single clown in it that I could see, um, because the panel that I assembled, when Rena asked me to host this meeting, the panel that we assembled um, were a number of people who have been involved with the circus, mostly in the way of being clowns or uh, being experts in some way on the clowning craft of circuses. And I'd like to introduce them briefly, one at a time. And uh, in terms of housekeeping, you have choices on your computer how you're viewing us. If you're viewing, you can look at Hollywood Squares. Uh, if you're on ga what's called gallery view, if you're on a PC. And that's usually uh, in the top right-hand corner of your computer. You'll see a thing that says View. And if you click on it with your left, uh, the left uh, mouse of your computer, the left part of your computer, left button, if you click on that, you'll find two choices. Uh, one will be Speaker View, and one will be Gallery View. Um, and if you're on Speaker View, only the speaker who is speaking will uh, be seen. If you're on Gallery View, you get Hollywood squares. And it's actually, with this few of us, as if we, if we remain this few, you can probably do, use either one. But I would suggest going to speaker view so that, we, um, so that you see the speaker, which is, makes it easier to understand our voice in the sometimes shaky technical world of Zoom. Um, so let me introduce who we've assembled for this panel. Um, and what I'm seeing is different, going to be different from what you're seeing. So if you put us on speaker view, I will ask each of you, as I'm talking about you, to raise your hand just so you see those of you who are still on gallery view. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Raise your hand if all that's, if you're all, I know we're all on the Zoom curve and it just keeps on climbing, as I found out when I did a little prep meeting with, with Larry. He knows more about Zoom than I do, and I've been trying to catch up for months. Um, so, uh, uh, Jason Allen, Jason, say something so you come on to the screen for everybody. Jason. Hi, Hello. Jason Allen here. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I'm the one with the lava lamp there, lava. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, so, Jason, and Larry, you can be helping by spotlighting whoever I'm talking about if you want to. You, if you left Cliff, you know how to spotlight Larry, I presume. So if you do that, I should be seeing Jason, even though right now I'm seeing Ron. Yep, now I am. Thank you, Larry. Wow. Larry, like our host, stuff. by the way. Larry is an Does author. His most recent uh, book, is, I believe, is about, uh, is about teenage 
is about uh, t uh, female daredevils, which is a, a <laughs> yes, and, and I'm not sure why that elicits that <laughs> reaction from Jason. It seems to have driven him mad. <laughs> Jason Allen is uh, considered the world's uh, premier impersonator of Charlie Chaplin. And he's also a voice expert in lip syncing. Although if I go really fast, he'll not be able to catch up with me. And except if I start to blubber, he'll, he'll go crazy and interrupt. And we'll be back in the presidential debate. But never mind about that. He's Canadian. He has no idea what I'm talking about. That's Jason Allen, who has done many, many things in his career. <laughs> um, then we, uh, we have Mr. Ron Campbell, um, who uh, we're particularly pleased to have here. Not that I'm uh, minimizing Jason's contribution, which I'm sure will be, will be profound. Uh, but Ron himself uh, is a, has been for many years a professional clown. He toured for seven years with Cirque du Soleil, one of the Cirque du Soleil, Soleil shows called uh, Zumba, which I'm sure he'll tell us all about. Um, uh, Kuza. Well, I got that wrong. Yeah. Zumba over <laughs> tonight. It's Luza. Zumba because everything is. We never Zumba. had the Cirque show Luza. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Jerk du Soleil. Anyway. <laughs> So then we have uh, John Towson, who is a, the, the eminence grease behind us, a man in the dark background, is uh, the author of, a, of a, a very valuable book that came out in, was that in the 1970s or the early 80s? 1976. 76, called Cloud. I'm still alive. I was young. Well, so it was a book about the history of clowns, a very valuable, uh, very readable story. It's like, uh, uh, you know, any good writing, uh, covering its subject for, uh, from antiquity to the present, then present day. That was really, and interestingly, right up to the cusp of when Cirque du Soleil suddenly appeared and took the very old circus art, uh, the, uh, these 200-year-old circus art that had been brought to a sort of peak, but by that time had gotten tired and was, was kind of fading out of the traditional circus as many of us grew up watching it, Ringling, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, um, and uh, was uh, already being, uh, these, these upstart new vaudeville performers, they were sometimes called, were beginning to uh, uh, give it a run for its money by, by going after something new, using the same sorts of uh, uh, performance, same sort of variety show that a circus was. In some cases, it was a circus, uh, in America, we didn't have that tradition, but in Europe, there's always been a tradition of small family, one ring kind of traveling circuses. Um, and the first in America that really got uh, some public renown was something called the Big Apple Circus. And I know that several of you can update me on that evolution if we want to go in that direction. And then uh, there's, uh, uh, and I think that's that's our, Sam, are you on the panel tonight or are you, are you, a, a, one of the participants. I'm an interloper. I came into the museum, uh, our Niles SNA Silent Film Museum, and uh, I'm on their computer there. That's why I was Zach Sutherland for a few minutes <laughs> until I changed that. But, but you, I, 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 it's up to whatever you uh, all would like. Uh, I've, I've done some research in the area of clowns who, you know, uh, transferred i guess you could say into silent film and uh I, I i'd love to be able to acknowledge john Towson's book which sits next to my two autographed bob sherwood hmm. <laughs> memoirs so it has okay. a very high place in my regard and uh, i don't know any book quite like john's so i i just wanted to tip my hat this hat john bunny's hat here <laughs> to uh, to John. So if I can contribute, that's fine, or I can mute myself and just and stop video, even if you'd prefer. And our own internal housekeeping, uh, since there are this few of us, I would say anybody who wants to say something, anybody who wants to ask a question of you uh, people who are joining us, which I'm very glad to see all of you, um, just hold your hand up and we'll be able to see that and I'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, usually people have to more or less mute themselves if we have a lot you know anything more than uh, five or six people because there's enough ambient sound you all know zoom is not 
dealing with sound in a super good way. Two people who, who try to talk at the same time, you won't hear their voices. It'll just be an electronic blare. Um, and uh, uh, yes, Ron, did you have something you wanted to, to interrupt? About? I, I just wanted to ask um, Sam and, and also, uh, 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 well, the, um, that, um, that path from the circus into silent film, where many of the performers were brought into the silent film. I, I have a theory on that, and I just want to know if it was true that um, here the silent film era had started, and they really needed people who were uh, the most interesting, daring people they could put on film. And that's where, why the vaudeville performers and everything came into silent film. Um, they didn't have to pay them every night. They could record them once and, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, I just thought it was an interesting time. Uh, and if you could speak a little bit about what it was like when the, uh, the producers were finding these circus performers. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what first got me interested was uh, John Lancaster was really a very prominent producing clown in the 1890s and turn of the century. And uh, he starred in a lot of ceiling films. And they hired him partly, be, not only because he was a clown, but a producing clown. So it would almost like a, a producer or director being hired. And he was expected to contribute a lot of comedy ideas. Uh, Rube Miller, who worked a lot for different companies, but kind of disappeared by 1920, was uh, an acrobat as well as a clown. And that was a, a, a great combination. Harry LaPearl even had his own series and he was phenomenally popular clown. Uh, the only footage I think I've ever seen of him is Polly at the Circus uh, in 1917, where you can see just very, very briefly his kind of odd little quirky walk in a parade. So uh, it's interesting how some were more successful than others. I'm not sure any of them became major figures in film. It, they were brought in, ho hopefully, but a lot of them didn't pan out, to be honest about it. So uh, anyway, I, I've always been intrigued by that. And I, I think it was their skill at invention and acrobats, acrobatics, that were kind of the two main things. Chris, you have a comment or a question? Yeah. Good question. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think you're right, Sam. Uh, I'm a circus historian, and the one who really made the successful transition was Poodles Hannaford, because he was a, uh, you know, he was an equestrian, he was an equestrian clown, and he w appeared in many silent films during that era, too. Yes, in fact, uh, he was the first, I think, hired uh, to sort of replace um, Roscoe Arbuckle uh, in a company called Real Comedies. And uh, uh, he, Ned Sparks was, made some, and then uh, Poodles Hannaford, and then the Weiss brothers also hired Poodles Hannaford, and some of those films are available on the Weiss brothers' DVDs. Um, let, uh, uh, yes, uh, um, Bob. Unmute. Am I unmuted? Yeah, okay. Uh, and Toto, there was a, a Toto the Clown that Stan Laurel replaced at Roland, right, Sam? Yes, uh, that's correct. And uh, I've seen a few of his, uh, I don't know if I've seen one or two of his films, MoMA found a few. And he's excellent. He's really funny. And it's a, it's a pity that he didn't, suppose he didn't like water. They wanted to throw him in water or something, and he had some issues. But... But anyway, Stan Laurel replaced him, which is interesting. He did, I don't know if Toto came back in the 20s, but he was definitely on film in the teens. Uh, no, to the problem with Toto was, uh, I'm sorry, John, do you have something to say? <laughs> well, yeah, Toto's great. Um, no, I was just going to raise, I, I, I haven't researched this. I'm intrigued by it. Um, I, I'm just wondering, you know, what, what the pay was for some of these guys in the circuits you know, versus in the movies, which is this suddenly growth industry, uh, you know, versus uh, the stage. I know, you know, people like like Slivers Oakley and Marceline, you know, who, you know, we think of, you know, the great, great clowns of that era, you know, but they left the circus to go like to Zigfield's Follies and stuff like that. 
you know, because that that was a step up from from being in a you know in a three ring circus. And I'm just wondering for the for the silent film comedians, and you know, if you look at it, so you know, so many of them. Oh yeah, this they they'd been with the circus, so there was there was this this big shift over, and I, I wonder how much of it had to do with money, and of course, opportunity to be featured you know, more close up and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, with, uh, t there was a problem with Toto, and that is that he had a, a, one, a bad eye, kind of a, I guess they call it a sty, and it was very problematic. A lot of people, mm -hmm. it, people found uh, uh, it, him uncomfortable to watch. And so Hal Roach terminated the contract because he said, oh, he's impossible, meaning, He's not photographing, he's not photogenic. So, uh, but Toto literally held whole crowds at the Hippodrome. I mean, he was a phenomenal performer. Now, some, someone who kind of worked out a little better was Clyde Cook, who also was uh, in the style of Toto, of that sort of uh, acrobatic clown. And uh, Sliver Zoakley, I would love to have seen probably more than any of the clowns ever, <laughs> yeah. because of he, he he's his what one man baseball game that kind of I think Buster Keaton was so enamored of that Keaton would sometimes recreate Sliver Zoakley's one man <laughs> baseball game, which well, he did it in Cameraman, right, or one of the, one movie he did sort Cameraman. of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he goes to Yankee Stadium and has his fantasy game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know anything about the game that uh, Toto did? What he did in his baseball routine was it a clown act or what? Well, Slivers Oakley did the baseball. Yeah, Slivers Oakley was the baseball. Uh -huh. Do you know anything about the act? Yes, I do. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Yeah. yeah, so it was, you know, I mean, you, you described the scene extremely well. It was a one-man baseball game. And so he was everything from the pitcher to the catcher to the batter to the fielder. And he played all of those roles. And where, as the, you know, especially the Barnum and Bailey Circus of pre-1918 was, uh, you know, in this enormous tent, bigger than a football field, he was the only thing that appeared at that time. They would shut down all the acts so that Slivers Oakley, who was kind of a throwback to the earlier clowns that, that had appeared in like Dan Rice back in the early, early days of the circus, uh, he had the, the circus to himself, the circus ring to himself, the arena. And so um, as the circus began to grow and he left the circus, as you mentioned, when he came back, there was really wasn't uh, a need for someone who was, um, the single act clown anymore and he actually you know he ended up killing himself oh <laughs> you haven't described his act though chris yeah it was a one-man baseball game where he would he played the part of the pitcher the catcher the batter and the fielder so, so he would throw he would throw the ball he would swing at the ball or catch it if it was a strike and then he would once it was hit he would go and and catch the catch it. well pantomime dan pantomime so, totally, yeah, totally in pantomime. He wore a birdcage for his catcher's mask. <laughs> what Keaton does in the cameraman is, is would you say that that was a, he's really um, doing that act or campaign or, or it's hard to know? Hard to know. Chris, Chris? I'm not the right, not the right I mean, person. obviously nobody is around today who saw Slivers Oakley act. So okay. basically what we have is what we have learned from reading about it. Uh, Eddie Bracken uh, actually performed, I don't know if he, he, he saw Slivers do it, but I saw Eddie Bracken live at the Players Club do this one man, maybe it was a six minute or eight minute turn, um, baseball in one pantomime. It was very funny. Red, and you get to Red ball Skelton and, did it. Red and Skelton yes. a version yeah, of it. Yeah. And then Skelton worked with Keaton at one point in the 30s when, you know, Keaton was working in Hollywood but not performing in, in big movies. And, and uh, uh, Keaton was brought in on a couple of Skelton movies. And I know Skelton performed some kind of similar routine. Mm -hmm. And my first acting job was seven, when I was seven years old on TV was on, with Red Skelton on the Red Skelton show. But that's, that's just an aside. <laughs> <laughs> You know, what was, what's happening here is an interesting reversal because 
you uh, historians uh, know more about film than we performers do. Um, all of us, we, we kind of selected the panel because everyone on the panel is a performer and uh, some of us have done clown things in, in circuses or elsewhere in other contexts. And so um, uh, we can keep going on and letting us be the audience and quiz you about it because I'm very interested in all this stuff. I think all of us are. Or we can go on. Uh, I, I think I'm going to flip around a little bit and let you supplement what I would like these folks to talk about, uh, which is the craft of, of clowning. Oh, when, no. when, when, uh, when I began thinking about doing this panel, um, I started thinking about all the movies that uh, I've seen, all the television I've seen that is either set in or relates to circus themes, either because there's one, you know, you can look at Batman as a sort of circus film because of the Joker. Um, uh, and literally the list goes on and on. It's hundreds and hundreds of, of high art and low art manifestations. I was thinking about all the things that, that inform Fellini's work that come right out of the circus. I, I was just watching the other day uh, because of this, uh, Ingmar Bergman's film, uh, um, sawdust and tinsel, which is, a, as all Bergman's films are, a very, very dark uh, and very, very striking uh, image of the circus, of a circus troupe, traveling troupe. Um, and, uh, but because we're, we represent a kind of uh, 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 practicing performers, I, I want to ask our panel some questions, and maybe the first one should go to John, which is, uh, although I think some of you, <laughs> a number of us could answer that, a number of you could answer that. Where, where does the word, I want to focus on clowning because that's what we know about, but where does the word clown actually come from, John? Do you know? Yeah, it, it, it's um, it's English. Uh, clone was a, uh, it was a rube. It was a country bumpkin, you know, and that's what it was in you know, in Shakespeare's time, characters like Dogberry in what's that Much Ado or whatever, uh, you know, they 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 were they were they were country bumpkins, and that was the clown. I, I think the the etymological root is with clod, you know, clod of earth. Um, so there were the clowns, you know, very distinct from the jesters, you know, uh, which you know the fool jesters also in Shakespeare's plays. Uh, so yeah, but that's where. Yep, that's where it comes from. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, of course, we all think of clowns now uh, as, as even with Cirque du Soleil's advent, there's still this, this persistent image of, somebody gave me this book some years ago called Scary Clowns. And when we look at 19th century clowns, of course, they do look very bizarre to us. Um, uh, I just watched a television show today that was a early television show, early 50s, um, called uh, Circus, what, 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 any of you know, it, it, it was a weekly circus show uh, that came out of Chicago. And there were there are these two clowns there that are, one's a sort of Emmett Kelly-ish clown, and they look just like these guys. They're scary looking. Um, and uh, um, so- Super uh, Circus was the name of that show. There you go. Yeah. Super Circus, thank you. And they did the Kellogg's commercials themselves. There was a, a woman who was a sort of Vanna White character. She's still, uh, she's still alive. She's in her 90s now. God bless her. And <laughs> somebody's restored it. Maybe it was you, Chris. And it's a nice, uh, I saw a very nice episode with a, somebody doing a, a very intense, a woman doing a very intense um, bar act where she's spinning on a bar. Eventually, she's spinning with a 14-year-old girl in tandem where they're both going like this like one of those uh, things that you uh, one of those toys uh, and her but her bars in the middle of her act collapse and she falls and it's live television folks and they close the curtain and the MC covers and suddenly she's back and she finishes the act but it's very apparent that she's quite upset and then the girl comes on the 14 year old girl comes on. It's very, it's very interesting. And Ron and I were talking today also about the fact that, that uh, one of the things, well, I brought my daughter to the circus when she was four years old. Uh, it was the Ringling Brothers, uh, you know, the, 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 the last uh, gasp of the Ringling Brothers, but it was in a big arena. 
all the traditional acts, and she was largely completely bored. And I suddenly realized the reason she was bored was to see a tightrope walker way up on high for her was like seeing somebody walk down the street because she has no conception of death. And there's no sense of, oh, how scary and difficult that must be to rope, to walk a, a high tightrope. Same thing with the trapeze. To her, it was like, just like she felt in the, in the swing in the park. When Tom and Jerry came out, co big costume characters, she was electrified and was, you know, was <laughs> saying their names and so on. And it made me realize one of the reasons that, that circus in and of itself, circus acts, daredevil circus acts particularly, don't um, don't translate very easily to film um, simply because we know it's film and we know it's past tense instead of present tense. And uh, so um, what I wanted to ask our clown performer participants, is, because we all went further than just loving the circus, it used to be a cliche when I was a kid that you would you wouldn't run away, you'd run away to join the circus. It was it was such a, a glamorous seeming thing to do. There was a television show about a kid in the circus called Circus Boy, right? And mm -hmm. uh, innumerable movies. I remember an episode of Superman taking us backstage. The Clown That Cried. It was called the Superman TV series. Um, uh, and you know most people don't get so influenced by film or circus that they devote their lives to it. I have a feeling that the people I'm looking at here are all people who have been galvanized by an inciting experience or maybe a series of them that caused us to do what we're doing, because obviously we're all specialists um, in these rather arcane things. And I'd like to ask our panel, what was it that got you started on the path to the career that you've had? And we might ask some of our participants as well, because as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a conversation between all of us. We're not going to just dominate. Um, how about you, Ron? Was there, was there one thing you can remember that that led to where you are now? Is, was there a, a kind of a flash of lightning uh, kind of experience? <laughs> the hook went in really early with me, really early. And I think it was, I had a grandmother who was reading me The Hobbit when I was maybe seven or six. And we got to the end of The Hobbit and she said, what would you like to hear now? What do you want to do with the Lord of the Rings? And she had a beautiful, rich Scottish accent and mellifluous voice. And, but I said, I don't know, no, nah, no. What else you got? And I don't know, she pulled out, I don't want to say it here because this is kind of a theater, but she pulled out the Scottish play. And in reading- Macbeth? Yes, there you go, thank you. At least you did it. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, it was a. Uh, it had swords and it had curses and it had and it had this rich language and and uh, I probably shouldn't be talking to a silent film <laughs> uh, uh, event with such a love of language and I kind of fell in love through language into Shakespeare. Shakespeare led to the theater. Theater led. I'm kind of a. Uh, I went from theater to circus rather than the other way around. A lot of the way it works uh, uh, in circus world is the acrobats can't really do those acts anymore and become clowns. Mm. That's why you see so many clown acts that are uh, involve ac acrobatics. And it's hard to do it wrong. Uh, just a quick anecdote, you know, um, one of the uh, Colombians, uh, Angelo, who I would bump fists with every night and say, let's do this before he stepped onto the wheel of death. And I didn't know that that might be the last words he ever says each night. <laughs> but um, one of the things he did was, you know, as you know, in a wheel of death act, he's on the outside of the wheel of death, jumping rope and tripping on the rope. And the trip has to be rehearsed. Um, the same thing, there was a, there, there's an accidental, uh, fake accidents in an act to build tension. And every time, oh, he tried, oh, he didn't make, oh, I made it. And we're creating that, that three level uh, catharsis, to use your words, Jason. Um, 
uh, that uh, it was really uh, putting their life on the line each night. And so I was, I was saying to Dan earlier today that so much of our consciousness these days is about frontliners and first responders and people who are putting their life on the line, you know, daily. And these guys were doing it. And, you know, I saw a guy break his femur in front of me. Um, I, I, a guy fell off a, you know, uh, off the wheel of death. And of course, the band came in with Stars and Stripes Forever, which was the cue. That meant clowns on stage, start doing some stuff and distract while we bring a stretcher in and take this guy off stage. So, <laughs> how, uh, many, how many people here um, have heard the term Hey Rube? Mm, too many times. Is it, is it still extant uh, then, Ron? It was extant at, at Cirque du Soleil? Yeah, well, they also called me Bub. Move <laughs> over, Bub. Oh, wait a minute. I, I, I'm thinking of a different context. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, so there's, a danger, you know, there's, there's a danger of the situation. So we'd be, uh, hey, Rube, meaning there's going to be a, there's a problem, a fire, okay. or a customer <laughs> getting angry about something, or somebody was cheated, or whatever. So and these four circus performers that come together, right? And I watched The Spieler today, and there was, there's a, a, a silent film equivalent of that uh, with a villain character who works for the circus. Instead of saying, hey, Rube, which they would have had to do in a subtitle, he just whistled, and suddenly all the other, they're actually his henchmen, come in and surround him so he can brutalize somebody, uh, or somebody can get hurt. But it's, the, it's a reversal of what the real thing is, which is, you, in the old circus, you hear somebody say, hey, Rube, and everybody would come running because there was an emergency. It was like mm -hmm. saying, help. Um, John, how about you? How, where did you? Well, I, I was in, in uh, back Fred and I with another performer were in touring with Hubert Castle Circus, and uh, we had a situation like that. Uh, there was an aerial act where you know three women were hanging by their by their hair, and um, the rigging collapsed, and they fell onto the arena floor. It wasn't attended; it was an indoor show in an arena, so onto the cement floor. And we had to get out there and cover. Uh, but hey, Rube, you know, it was more like, hey, clowns, get the hell out there. Quick, 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 clowns, get out there. It wasn't hey, Rube. I mean, clowns on stage. That's what I, I, think, I, that, I think that's an earlier, earlier era. I want to go back to the, uh, my original question, um, uh, which was what inspired you, John? Was there a thing that inspired you to live the life, the strange life that I know you have? Well, you know, I give you a 30 second answer. I grew up as a childhood actor on television, which sort of happened by chance, but I enjoyed it. Uh, and then uh, sort of faded away from that and then kind of went through a very intellectual period in college and I didn't really like it. And I kind of in my 20s discovered circus, you know, and this is like late 60s, early 70s when suddenly a lot of things were happening with, with uh, you know, the, the counterculture, and circus was part of the counterculture, you know? And, and, and to me, to be able to juggle, when I learned to juggle like at 23 or something, you know, I liked that a lot better than, you know, the more intellectual stuff I'd been doing. And, you know, like the, and, you know, before Big Apple was big, I would say Pickle Family Circus actually was even more of an influence. Uh, but, you know, people, people were doing all kinds of stuff, and, I happened to be at NYU, and I studied, got to study with Hubby Burgess, and uh, you know, I just fell in love with doing all that stuff. And then the, cl the clown part of it for me was, you know, that's the, you'd have to do a psychological case study, but you know, I I, I guess I found uh, some freedom in self-deprecating uh, humor, you know, and also in be, being able to pay, make people laugh and and. Uh, and uh, being able to talk to women that way. So all of those sort of came together. And of course, you know, there was, there was the big romance of the circus, but um, I was never really into Ringling Brothers. Uh, I didn't really enjoy it. I actually went to Clown College in 73 when Bill Ballantyne was running it, and I didn't think it was very good at all. I was never with that show, but I worked with three or four circuses. Uh, but basically, but more, but, but uh, most of the work I did when I was performing heavily was was just doing our own shows, you know, and wherever we could get it, we were just gigging wherever we could get a gig, whether it was a 
a festival or, or, or uh, a school or a college, whatever. Um, and because uh, because we had more control over that, and the money was better. Thank you, thank you, John. How about you, Jason? Um, yeah, Hey Rube uh, is uh, a Beatles song. <laughs> One of their dark songs. That's all I had to say. That's why I'm here. So. That was the way they. That's the way they they distributed it in Canada. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, when you when you translate it to Canadian, it's it's uh, Jude, Jude. Hey Jude. <laughs> So what started you as a as a performer? What started you on that that path? Were you were you in the talent shows as a kid? What was what was it? It was uh, Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. Watching Sesame Street uh, as a consumer, so a little boy watching TV and um, realizing it's fake, knowing there's a camera there, and I never never got the magic of these creatures, these puppets being actual living things as a kid. I always. I always knew, or I, I feel like I've always known that there were men with their hands up them and cameras. <laughs> I thought, and there's little kids walking around. I thought, I would love to be one of these kids. And uh, I, I guess I never, ever let that go. I, I love the magic of it all. And um, I would say my biggest dream was just to get on television just do anything if i could just do something on television and then i can die that's all so that that was always the the carrot in front of my nose and still is so okay <laughs> second question then that's related to that and i'm going to keep it on our panel uh, everybody for for a little bit is when did you first realize when did you first make up your own jokes when did you first realize that it was possible because you know the things you do as a kid you, you, i used to do magic as a kid and i would read in books the magic tricks and they would tell you exactly what to say just like an actor reading a script uh, of a play um whereas if you when you get interested in 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 being funny being a clown being uh, a, a, a making up your own stories and making up your own comedy stories, if that's what it is, maybe even stand-up comedy. Um, I, I, I wonder at what point each of you realized that it was possible, because I know I worshipped the performers I saw on television. They were gods, um, sometimes in, like in Superman's case, literally, uh, you know, supernatural beings. Um, and all the circus performers, you, all the actors and the things you would see in movies. And I never dreamed that I could be part of that world in a, in a creative sense. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I'm still rather uh, um, amazed that it, it, it has happened for me. So what, what, about, what, about, uh, what about you folks? Let's go back to John. How about you, John? When did you realize you could be a, a funny guy? I think when it, I mean, I'm sure I made some dumb jokes as a kid, uh, but I think in my, maybe my junior year in college, which is pretty late, was when I started to discover just in conversations that I could be, I could bring a funny perspective to things. And, you know, and at that time, I was very shy and it really was a way that I could talk to girls, you know? Uh, so that, that was, uh, you know, that was paid dirt right there. Yeah. That sounds like a great, great motivator to me too. How about you, Ron? I don't know. I, while you were talking, I was, I wouldn't, was going back to the earlier memories. When I, when I was a kid, I, we had a pool and I used to always say, shoot me, shoot me because I could die, you know, in the pool. And, and well, we moved and we didn't have a pool anymore, but I kept saying, shoot me, you know, my, my dad, my mom, you know, bang, your dad, you know, and I would do another death scene. And then, um, but sometimes, you know, every, he would, they would shoot me, but I would still want to get a drink of Coca-Cola or something like that. So I would stagger half dying, half alive to the next, you know, to do the things, which is really kind of what my clown persona has become a guy who's just trying to do things and gets and things get in the way obstacles get in the way so i think that that the start of my clown if, if we're talking about origins was was way back then around the pool <laughs> mm -hmm. 
any anything that we're saying uh, that uh, makes any of you uh, uh, folks out there want to ask a question of any of us, please feel free to just waggle your hand and we'll we'll call you. I'm not tracking the comments, the chat comments, but I think Larry is. And uh, is there anything on chat that we want to address at this point, Larry, or is it is it people incoherent babbling? <laughs> I think people are paying more attention to what we're saying than the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, but uh, here Michael has a comment or a question um, or possibly simply uh, a, an endorsement. I, I hope so. Oh, well, I sure endorse you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, I had a comic book, a circus comic book, and it was called Super Circus. And is anybody uh, familiar with that? Yeah, it was a it was a spinoff from the ABC television show. It was a spinoff from what, uh, Chris? You just muted yourself. We can't hear you. It was the spinoff from the ABC television show starring Mary Hartline that you were talking about earlier. That's right. I I was trying to think of that name. Yeah. Okay, so I was wondering, so the comic book was a spinoff of the TV. Not, okay, I was thinking maybe it was the other way around. Okay. And did Very that good. inspire you to be a be a circus kind of performer, um, or or uh, I mean, you've gotten very involved in the world of, of of classic film and film preservation. That you're one of the stalwarts of the museum, of course. Oh, thank you. No, the only uh, involvement I've had with any circus is just sitting in the stands and enjoying the uh, enjoying it. You know what what you said, Ron, reminds me too that uh, I used to think. Uh, I used to look with sadness to the time when I might not be interested in reading my comics over and over because I collected them very avidly as a child. And but I and and, and me too. My mom threw them away. Well, I that's a story we all have. Yeah, exactly. And uh, but but I also looked towards uh, this unknown, unimaginable future where I wouldn't be interested in playing because when you're a kid, of course, your job is to play as much as possible. And everything else is a is a is a distraction from the real job, which is to play uh, with your friends or you know just the things you want to do on your own of drawing or whatever. And uh, when I uh, when I got into performing, in my case, um, thank you for all for asking. Um, I got into performing, you know, simply because of movies that I saw. I saw a movie about Houdini with Tony Curtis, and I wanted to be in that world somehow. And a kid in in school did a magic trick for me uh, a year later, and I instantly befriended that kid. And before you know it, I was 12 years old and doing shows at birthday parties for often snot-nosed, obnoxious, sugar-crazed children. Uh, <laughs> didn't think of that as a as a life path because it was, uh, you know, I was I, I, I was going to go to college. I was expected to go to college and you didn't do, you didn't, there was no magic college in those days anyway. Uh, and, and I, so I studied industrial design and they showed a Charlie Chaplin movie and it was the first time I'd ever seen a Charlie Chaplin movie. And it simply did the same thing that the Houdini movie did. And I wanted to be, well, what are you going to do with that? And uh, uh, then there happened to be a great mime artist doing what we think of as mime now, or what we thought of as mime for the last part of the 20th century, meaning a guy in tights or Marcel Marceau in his sort of sailor suit with white makeup like a clown, but not with a nose like a clown. Makeup that was just highlighting their normal features rather than creating a single face that they could have, um, but with, the, with that same strange uh, quality, maybe even stranger, because it was just uh, really a face that was uh, with with the stark outline of the lips and the uh, you know it was it was like an ample like a Chinese geisha kind of a a face. And this guy could do things that looked like magic tricks. You see, he he could lean on thin air like this, and and uh, I it was like magic combined with what I saw Charlie Chaplin doing played all the parts, like I was quizzing you all about the baseball routine. I want to know about that because my teacher, who's still alive, 93, uh, his name is Jewel Walker, was one of the great 20th century mime artists and uh, 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 would play all the characters. And he was a professional b baseball player before he got into theater, which he did, by the way, John, as he told me, 
because he's somebody told him it was a good way to meet girls, go to a theater, <laughs> class, get more girls and boys in the theater class, and so he did. Um, uh, they were right. <laughs> well, exactly, and uh, uh, so I became one of those. It was before mime had its sort of big surge, which happened in the late '60s. I was it, this was in a little bit earlier in the '60s, uh, and so I became you know before people had the word mime, and before you know a good 15 years before they hated the word mime and the idea of mime, um, since you know because it always goes in trends. Uh, I became a mime, uh, and then you know as people were starting to get tired of mime, I was just beginning really to perform professionally. Um, <laughs> I realized I wanted to talk as part of my shows. I, I felt the need to, and so what happened with me, I, I mean, I never thought I could come up with physical gags, but I had to because there was no playbook. You know, you could do this or, or you know, illusion. That's not a story. It's just a, it's just like giving you the alphabet and saying, here, write a story, here's some words, but you, you still have to come up with characters and situations, plots. Um, and I started to want to break silence. And I, I, I still remember this. And I was asking, I was pressing you about the moment that you guys have had these inciting incidents. Because I remember sitting in my dining room, some people were over. And I remember I started, I was making jokes as I always do with my friends. But I realized I'm suddenly listening to myself. In the same way, when I get into mime, suddenly I couldn't sit normally anymore because I'm always thinking, whoa, my hand is on my, oh, what's, what's that? And what's that trying to decipher the body language? And uh, suddenly I, I'm listening to myself and for, for things that I might be able to use. Uh, or if I improvise something on, you know, I, I would write them down. And so that's what, that's that, that, what led to my path. Um, so, um, you know, since we're a mix of film, history, live entertainment. I want to I want to interject something here. I want to bring in Charlie Chaplin. Um, I discovered an article which I've passed on to Jason. Marceline, I just found out today there's there exists some film from a paper negative of the clown Marceline. Do you all know who Marceline was? Uh, some of our my clown uh, uh, colleagues may not know Marceline. Some of you guys might because of if you're Chaplin buffs because he talks about him in his autobiography. Marceline, when Chaplin was nine years old, he went on the stage as part of a dancing company, a, a clog dancing company. Um, and they toured, they were very successful, eight Lancashire lads. And the precision tap dancing was what it was. They got hired by the London Hippodrome in the Christmas season to do one of the big Christmas pantomimes, which were essentially musical theater fairy tales for children. And this was Cinderella. And Marceline was the headliner of the show, and he did a scene in the kitchen, and they wanted the um, Mar the Lancashire lads to play cats and dogs in cats and dog full costumes. Uh, and Chaplin was asked to be Marceline's assistant for it. He played a cat or a dog. It's a little unclear. He says a dog. Um, uh, and Marceline was supposed to back up and trip over him. And Chaplin was utterly fascinated because Marceline held the huge hippodrome crowd spellbound with his with his antics and years later marceline the he, he was a headliner at the london hippodrome then he went on to the new york hippodrome when that was built and turn of the century uh you know and stayed there for a headliner but the new york hippodrome fell on hard times and he was left to working in smaller circuses and one of those circuses came to hollywood in 1919 and Marceline was in it. And Chaplin at that time was on top of the world, as you all know. Uh, he had just started making films for First National, the First National Company. And his first one was A Dog's Life, which many people uh, consider his best, if not his, you know, uh, uh, one of his best films. Um, every time he got more money, it seemed to inspire Chaplin. <laughs> to greater artistic heights, because his first film for every company is a big artistic leap. When he goes from key, starts with Keystone, then SNA, the first film is is really good. Mutual, the first film is different qualitatively, partially because Chaplin was able to channel everybody around him, and it was a different crowd around him each time. So he gets to First National, he makes a dog's life, and then the U.S. Treasurer says, "We want you to help raise money with the other big stars." Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, sell war bonds for us, do a war bond tour. And he goes out for, for uh, three, three, th 
about three weeks, barnstorming two, three cities a day, and raises the equivalent in today's money of $800 million, because the crowds are unbelievable everywhere he goes, along with Mary Pickford, and I mean, they're all doing separate. They divide up the country. Chaplin comes back and does something unbelievable. He makes a comedy about a war that's still going on, shoulder arms, uh, and it blows everybody away. Then he burns out, he's, he's, and he goes to the circus in 1919, a year that he's starting to make, he's make, he makes two of the worst films he had made up to that time in his career, but he goes to see, he wants to see Marceline again. And I would like Jason to, if you wouldn't mind, Jason, who's a, a chaplain expert um, uh, and so knowledgeable, uh, to read an article that I discovered from 1919 in which the, the, the woman went to the circus and it was, it was in a film magazine called Picture Play, and she, went, she goes to the circus and they put her in the circus. And the first part of the article is her encounters with all the people and, and how interesting they are and, and they, let, they let her ride the elephant in the circus parade. Um, but the second, but all, she says, all everybody can, they don't want to talk about the circus. They don't want to talk about what they're doing. All they want to talk about is Charlie Chaplin's coming to see us and we're going to get to see Charlie Chaplin. And, by, and they want to tell her what's, and, 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 and then the second day, she knew him from earlier interviews, so she went to his studio and interviewed him about the experience. And this is what he has to say about the circus. Jason. The next day, I interviewed Charlie at his studio. He was standing hatless on the steps as I came along, so I perched myself on the big brick porch rail. I wanted to ask about his next picture, but he forestalled me. You know, I'd like to make a circus picture. <laughs> I went behind the scenes yesterday. Did you hear about it? I said uh, a trifle wearily that I had heard about it. What I did not say was that I heard nothing else. <laughs> it was great stuff. I enjoyed it immensely, you know. And yet, well, it seems sort of pathetic to me. It is, a, it is typical of Chaplin to remark the shadowed tones of any picture, perhaps that that is why he is a great comedian. It was all so artificial, so tawdry, so inconvenient. There's so much confusion, so little privacy, you know. I, I, could, I, I couldn't help but think of the people as puppets, dressed gaily for, for a little hour, to bend and nod and smile, to do their little stunt than to be chuckled back into their box. And then, you know, he went on, I, I, I think they felt that way about me. I, I, I was sort of uh, uh, a shadow, uh, uh, me, I, I was sort of a shadow that had come off the screen for a while and I'm afraid they were disappointed in me. They expected me to be funny and to crack jokes. They seemed awfully surprised to find that I was just human. We talked of the clowns and of the one who uh, imitated the chaplain walk. I found after the last performance, he went on, that Marceline, who was uh, at one time the world's most famous clown, uh, was among the slapstick fellows that night. Not, not featured, not billed in any way, just uh, a common clown that uh, struck me awfully hard. You see, I, I played on the same bill with Marceline years ago in London when he was the rage. And yesterday, after uh, noon, they told me he sneaked away and avoided meeting me. A thing like that is wretched, isn't it? We continue to talk circus instead of picture. The pageant wasn't a beautiful thing, he, he said uh, as I rose to leave. Did you see it? I did, I replied, from the lead elephant. You, you rode an elephant, he exclaimed. Gee, why didn't I think of doing that? I surely envy you. And I went out walking on air. It is something to be envied by a million dollar comedian. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jason. So uh, his first films for First National were where they were advertised, this, the salary that he was offered was unprecedented, a million dollars to make eight, what they thought would be two real films. Um, and and uh, they, they actually used it in the advertising, his first million dollar picture, his second million dollar picture. Um, 
what's interesting too about this story, which I found so fascinating, is that Chaplin tells it again in his autobiography. He doesn't tell about meeting the reporter. He tells about going to see Marceline in 1918 or 1919. And in his autobiography, he remembers actually meeting him, seeing him, and that he that he just looked sort of indifferent and sad, and that a year or two later he died. In fact, it was, does anybody know when Marceline died? Do you know, Sam? It was, it was sometime in the mid-20s. A few years later, he, he committed suicide. Um, and, uh, you know, so you see there in the making, not only Chaplin's inspiration for the circus, um, but his inspiration for Limelight, which is about a failed um, uh, mm -hmm. comedian. Um, so I, I, I thought you'd all enjoy that, that anecdote. What, what, what were you going to say, Bob? Well, uh, Jason might know this clown's name, but when I was small, I, I'm trying to, I was born in 1960, so we'll say around 1965, 66, I saw Ringling Brothers. Uh, Lou Jacobs was king of the clowns. He came out with a, a small dog that was dressed as an elephant, I remember. And there was a, a little person who was chaplain, he was dressed as chaplain, and he was brilliant. And I, I don't know his name, but I believe he, he was with Ringling Brothers brothers a long time he, he may have been Spanish or something but he was and he was so small but he was hilarious doing Chaplin shtick I don't know if Jason would know his name or um I know some clowns Peter Petoskey I can maybe ask him I know a few people but uh, I don't remember his name but he was wonderful and supposedly he had he had been like the Chaplin guy in Ringling Brothers for a long time does anybody know the name of that Spanish clown that was with Ringling that late there, there, were a, there was a long tradition of clowns, uh, circus clowns, who would dress as Chaplin. Uh, yeah. uh, I read about them in the books. I don't, I've never seen, well, I think one of them is on film, uh, Charlie Revels or R Rivals? Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce, how do you pronounce his name, Ron? Do you know? Uh, Revely, is it? It looks yeah, like- I saw, R him I saw him, yeah. You saw him in person? Yeah. Oh, really? You saw him in person? I think so, yeah. Huh. They, they, I, yeah. And to the end of his life, of course, Chaplin lived in Switzerland, uh, and and he would go to the um, to the um, circus knee when it came to and and basically stop the show. I mean, they were everybody, all eyes were on him, and he would you know he would give his benediction to the performers, who included the great contemporary clown or or recently contemporary clown Dimitri, who was a Swiss clown. Um, uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, uh, we, we must quiz you a little bit, Ron, about your, you, you are the only, although we're all performers, uh, you're the only one who really lived the life of a touring circus performer. And what I want to address, what I'd like you to address, to tell us about is, of course, by the time that I took my daughter to that show, it, it was clear that Ringling was, uh, it, it looked tawdry just like Chaplin was describing it in 1919. But you see a live circus with the, with the smells and the sawdust. I saw a, a recent one in, in Paris in about four years ago with the uh, French comedian and, and uh, the, the uh, assistant to Jacques Tati named Pierre Etex. Mm. Um, and it was, it was around his clown character that he, he quit working with Tati to, to marry the uh, Annie Fratellini of the Fratellini clown family and they and establish a circus school with her, which yeah. they did for years. And then he started making movies and one of them was about a clown named Yo-Yo and he was playing his Yo-Yo character and it was this little one ring circus just like in a Fellini or a Bergman film and it was um, uh, at the intermission, uh, I, I got to know Pierre and at the intermission uh, he invited us, to, my daughter was with me and also uh, uh, some a couple of other friends and into his trailer and it was like being in the Marx Brothers movie at the circus. Remember when he goes into the midgets uh, uh, trailer or, or house and all the furniture is real small. There, the furniture wasn't small, but there were seven of us in a room. You know that that you know we were jammed up against each other as he's in full makeup and just uh, you know chatting away with his giant shoes and uh, it was really very magical and it was right on. It was just right off the, uh, the, 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 there was no, it was winter. And so it was indoors, but they had made the circus and every, the person who got the tickets from you was on a tightrope and, you know, the, so everybody did everything. And so it was very charming and wonderful 
and also in a certain way a little sad as well. And what I would like you to address, Ron, is Cirque du Soleil, their first slogan when they hit in a big way was we, we reinvent the circus. At least it was on their first, the first commercially available video they made of their stuff. And I think it's such an accurate uh, slogan for them, but, uh, and it really did re revivify the circus. And can you address that, uh, that uh, as well as giving us a little bit of a picture of, of what your life was doing the same damn show for seven years in a row, the same, more or less the same, uh, uh, I presume the, the template was the same. It was the same uh, Kuza show, right? Uh, every single show is different, as you guys know. It's a performance, well, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I stand uh, corrected. Yeah. And you would look on the board to see who was out and who was injured and who was in and what the order was going to be that night and, you know, th that kind of thing. But uh, I don't know, to, to, to answer your question, uh, how uh, the reinvention of, of circus that Cirque du Soleil offered... Um, well, one of the guys, one of the clowns was uh, David Shiner, you know, in the, uh, that original Cirque. Uh, and he's pretty much of a genius. And he was also the director of Kuza later on. Um, and uh, he wanted Kuza to have a kind of a circus theme. We had, you know, confetti cannons and, uh, you know, so there was that kind of feeling. Um, uh, but the day-to-day -day of living a life in the circus is something that, you know, some of the, the, the great sad laugh clown laugh and some of the sad, like what you're alluding to, the sad edge of, of what circus is, um, uh, wasn't far from anybody's, you know, awareness. Um, I do remember a, like a Cirque du which was uh, the ushers at, at Cirque du Soleil, who they, some of them kind of stay with the circus a lot of like maybe the roustabouts in in the earlier time, you know, um, but uh, one of them said uh, was talking to one of the Queroses, who was a the high wire act, uh, fifth generation Spanish high wire guys, uh, um, uh, and one of the daughters of that family was running around backstage somewhere, and an usher uh, uh, said, um, "Oh, you can't be here. You can't be around here. This is." you know, the, the, this is dangerous and everything. And at that moment, Vincenti, who is one of these Spanish high wire macho daredevils who's risking his life every night, he, he, goes, he goes, this is my daughter and she can go anywhere she wants to. She, we have been with, uh, in the circus for five generations. We, she has been around elephants since she was, she was I, I held her in my hand. She has been around everything. She, she, has, she has seen everything. She has seen things forklifts moving in their direction. She can do anything she wants to. And so stop the noise coming out from your mouth. Mm -hmm. you know, well, uh, Ron, the, the, uh, in the reinvention sense, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the first obvious thing that struck me when I saw Big Apple, well, not Big Apple, because they did use animals. There are no animals, uh, as far uh, as I know, in any of the we were, we were the animals. Lay shows. Um, uh, and the reinvention is there are the families were allowed to continue because there were, of course, tightrope walking is tightrope walking. It's just that, and, and trapeze is trapeze. And I, I went, when I first started seeing the circus shows, thinking, what can they show me I haven't seen on Ed Sullivan or on, on the circus? There was a show called Circus of the Stars, an annual show every year. It was kind of like celebrities would be incorporated into a circus act. What can they show me that we haven't seen before? And they do. For example, the trapeze artists are going on the trapezes, and there are six of them, though, going in a circle, and then they let go, and they start to flip down to the foot, and then, then we realize that they're on, they're attached to bungee cords, and they come down to within a few feet from your head, and you go back up, uh, they go back up and grab the thing again, and you're sitting there as, an, as an, a mature adult with your mouth open, because it's like, it is, it, 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 it takes you back to being five or six years old again, and that sense of awe that the old circus did trade on, that did inspire. What I wonder from you, because you, you played the clown for so many years, is, uh, and I saw some of the clown acts so I could make my own cut, but I never saw yours. Could you tell me 
what the could you tell us what the what the act was like and in what way did it did it reinvent the clown thing or was it not so much different from what Marceline might have done or any other great clown, uh, Poodles Hannaford, uh, Emmett Kelly, or or was it or was it something uniquely um, uh, new about it? What was some you know wonderful tropes that we played upon and and didn't ignore, but Shiner at the helm of it has a kind of malevolent edge that I haven't seen in a lot of clowning, especially even in Sir. We were the only uh, speaking Sir clown. We didn't speak gibberish. We actually, you know, uh, and a lot of it was what I like to call involunteer work or, or victim work, where you're pulling someone from the audience, pulling the right person with the right amount of reticence. And that was my job every night, to find this person and, and then work in these, play these games. You, you mentioned earlier about play. And we really just, uh, I, I often wonder, you know, what, what was my skill, I, you know, that, I, well, I wasn't hanging on the edge of a uh, wheel of death, but what, what was, what, what tightrope did I have to walk, me and my fellow clowns? And that was more um, giving a sense of the emotional uh, humanness, the human quotient. Uh, a big part of our sh show is that, yeah, these are superheroes and they're coming down on a bungee cord and then going away and, and is that a human body that's spinning that fast and all those things? And then the audience needs at a certain point. And I think that was kind of, you know, maybe Gita Liberté's genius to find when, when and where the audience needs to be reminded that everybody's human, that everybody steps I'm, I'm, I'm still not getting a picture of what, what your act was like though, what your clown uh, sketch oh. was like. Uh, like well, it was just something more stupid and basic. It was a trio and I, uh, I was the king of the clowns. Uh, I was pulled on in a chariot and my two helpers, which was a kind of um, two zannies really in, in the commedia sense, um, who are trying to please me. And I am the biggest fool of all. And we worked in, like I say, these games of threes where I had a stun gun, I had a stake, which I, hit every single member of the, the front row, you know, would get a, a, a hit. Um, so there was a real- On the stake? Yeah. You mean like the stake you would put on the ground? Yeah, so the drummer, the, the, the drummer had a midi, whatever, that made that kind of kung fu crack every time my rubber stake hit the head of anybody. Ah. Hmm. And uh, so that was great fun and it was real slapstick, real strong slapstick. And we pull an audience member into that world uh, where this mad king can decide, make, change the rules in a moment's notice. And when I zap one clown, he'd go down. I zap the other clown, he'd go down. In that beautiful comedy rule of threes, I'd zap the audience member. And now he, as a, as a representative of the audience, now on stage with us, would fall down. Would do, a, would do a death scene just like I did around the pool, you know, and audiences would love that person. Mm. And so a big part of our act was to get the audience to fall in love with themselves, or at least a representative member of them, uh, that they could vicariously be on stage with these, in this madness and triumph over even the king. And so we did a couple of those, then we did a, a kind of magic act where we had a false chair and I would go under the chair, then we'd pull an audience member of a woman, but it changed country to country. Uh, we couldn't pull a woman, uh, a pretty woman from uh, a Russian audience without having the, the, her boyfriend say, no, you can't take her. <laughs> She's not going up with you. Uh, I, and I work with some very shy gentlemen in Japan, say, you know, who, uh, uh, just in that moment, like when I zap somebody in America, they go down on their back. 99% of the time, they fall down and then lie on their back. 99.999% of the time in Japan, they went down on their front. These are cultural things that we found out every night that were really, it was fascinating to have, like you say, it, it was more than, you know, 2,000 performed more than that. Uh, 
and uh, but each night was a refinement, a change. What what got a laugh there? What how can we show the audience that it is happening that night for them only? Can we actually fake this? What I call a kind of uh, it's the secret smile that the audience gets to look in and see us break character and laugh at, this, at what is happening and actually be playing right in front of them. And so that was a challenge. And with that 3,000 person jury every night, it was uh, um, one of the harder things was going to sleep at night, you know, after all that adrenaline. And, and how long would you tend to play in a single uh, date? Uh, single cities, usually around, it depends on the city, you know, uh, if it was Paris, it was like five months, you know. It was, oh, wow. Uh, if it was uh, Buenos Aires, it was like four months, a lo little bit longer. But then we do, you know, smaller, you know, uh, Tampa, you know, for three months or two months, you know. Well, I, I say that as a, with great envy as a person for whom playing two nights in the same theater is a great to be able to leave my makeup sitting out is a great, <laughs> great uh, luxury. And uh, um, because as you know, when you go to another theater, it's not the same. That changes everything too. It, it was in a big top. So it had that true circus energy. And I, I imagine the parade film that you guys, you know, watched earlier tonight, that the way it moved through the city that sold every ticket that parade. You know, those kids hanging on the wagons, they're going to they're going to go or they'll sneak in. Somehow they're going to be there. And uh, interested in the fact in that parade film, too, that uh, right in the very first shot, the, the crowd is is a mixed crowd of black and white people yeah. just standing there together. It's democratized them. I'm sure the city was no more uh, integrated than any city in America at that time. But in the context of gawking at the, and there's a crowd of children that came out and I can't quite tell. It looks like they might be a little rascals, uh, mixed race. I'm not right. sure about that, um, uh, which was heartening to see because I, we're always, all of us in, in, in the world of, of the arts and theater, you know, hope that our art is one that brings people together. I want to point out some, an oddity too that I noticed in the Spielers, it's not an oddity at all. There's the villain of the piece. Um, is a, an actor who plays a character named Red in the Spielers. And he was a very popular villain character who later ap uh, appears in one of W.C. Fields' least commented and appreciated films, which I think is one of his best. He made a film in the mid-30s called Mississippi, where he's a, a steamboat captain, a showboat captain. It's kind of like a, a, a spin on showboat. And, uh, uh, and the entertainer he gets, he picks up on the wharf, as it were, is uh, Bing Crosby. It's a co-starring Bing Crosby and, and uh, uh, Fields has one of his inimitable card games in it. And this guy who plays Red in the Spielers plays uh, Captain Blackie is all we know is his name. And he, he just has the greatest scowl and he ends up getting into a knockdown drag out fight after this hilarious card game, which Fields is outrageously cheating in, but Blackie is onto him. Uh, Bing has a, a fight with him, and it's a it's it's a nice uh, continuation to see the um, um, that guy's that guy's career. He's very good. They're all good. It's a good good cast in the Spielers. Uh, uh, before we we only have a few more minutes left, and we, we're going to have time to answer, to deal with all your questions. But I want to mention so I don't forget it at the end that in a month from now, uh, it, it's it is on. Um, there's going to be two. Uh, it's November 21st, and there's going to be two uh, sessions of interest. Um, the, um, the one is uh, going to be about um, where that, uh, uh, I know we're going to have a, a circus expert telling us what the uh, different uh, uh, cars are going for the wagons. Is that you, in fact, Chris? I hope to be a part of it, yeah. I, um, you know, I, and I just want to, I, I know you've got something else you want to say here, but I want to kind of address something that you said about the parade earlier, uh, and the, the people who were there. The circus was for the masses, not for the classes, especially the parade. You know, this is something that was free, and this was available to everybody who was there. The circus, the American circus, 
if you take it back to really kind of its earliest roots, the fact that it was traveling across the country and bringing new things to the community, it was really a uniting factor at a time when there weren't films, when there wasn't broadcasting, and when really newspapers were very slow in getting information to people. But, you know, if you take a look at uh, P.G. Lowry, uh, who was an African-American band leader on the, on the Ringling Circus, he brought jazz to the United States, P.G. Lowry did. You know, these were people, you know, Dan Rice, who was one of the great American, first American clowns, he was a political clown during the time of, you know, even before Abraham Lincoln, he was talking about political things in Chicago one week and then maybe in Cincinnati a couple of weeks later. So, you know, I think that when you take a look at the film, at the film industry, because in many ways, the film industry was one of the things that killed the circus, because suddenly now you had, you had entertainment that was available, again, for the masses, very well produced, and, and provided, you know, in these, you know, sometimes very ornate theaters. Uh, in 1926, and I don't want to hijack your call right now, but in 1926, there was a silent film that was actually Joseph Kennedy's first silent film uh, that Ralph Ince did called uh, Bigger Than Barnum. And if you, t it's a lost film, you can't find it now. But Bigger Than Barnum in 1926 was such a significant film and such a threat to the Ringling Circus they got a. They actually got a court order to stop that film from being from being exhibited after it had already been produced. So you know, I think that the the Ringling Circus in particular in 1926, which was was huge, it was bigger than any circus, felt that films were going to be you know one of the things that ended up killing it. And along with television and radio, it did. So that's a little uh, whet your appetite about our November 21st uh, call. And the same thing happened, of course, with vaudeville and with theater. I mean, film became so, as we all know, it became the art form of the 20th century. The other film I was, so it is one is one of the sessions is going to be devoted to that, that uh, wonderful three minute rediscovery film from 1902. The other is going to be a session on Chaplin's film, The Circus, along with Limelight. And among the panelists on that is going to be Chaplin's son, Eugene, who ran a circus in somewhere in Europe, I think, I'm not sure where in Europe. Um, in, uh, in Switzerland. Oh, thanks. So yeah. you, you know about that too. So that, that's on, these are both going to be on November 21st, so, so watch that. And Bob, Bob, what was, you, what was your comment? Well, I, I'm, um, I'm a comedian and actor, and I worked with um, David Shiner on Pomp, Duck, and Circumstance. Which oh, yeah, yeah. A circus dinner theater in a tent. And I did it here for about a week or two in New York. I'm in New York here. And then we went to Atlanta. So I, I guess I spent a, a summer doing circus. And there, there are gags. And it was different for me. I was the heckler. I heckled everybody in the food and everything. So I got to improvise quite a bit. And there were definitely gags that some of the German performers and some of the French performers wanted to do, and some of the clowns involving spitting, licking somebody's face. These were things you could not do <laughs> in the United States. It, it, would, it would be unbelievable, I mean, the reaction you would get. So you had to find different ways of, of, of doing that. So it's very interesting that as a, as a clown, as you know, it's European-wise versus uh, American. And of course, the producers were German, you may know. And one night I mm -hmm. improvised this whole thing. There was an actual Atlanta baseball player who dropped the ball in a big game. He was there. And I just started doing whatever I did. Of course, you didn't drop that tray as well as whoever his name was. I can't even remember his name. And the crowd went nuts. And I, said, and I started throwing things at him. And he, and he would drop it. And it was, it was brilliant. And, and that night after the show, the, the producers come over to me in their German second language is English you know, dialect. They do what you did tonight. Do that tomorrow. I said, I, he's not going to. He's not gonna be here tomorrow. <laughs> do do what you did. What you did. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. But that's the hazards of that type of, um, especially David China's work. That improv with other people. You don't know how it's gonna go. It's it's um, every night is different. Well, I'm glad you're bringing up that that fundamental issue, especially since we're a crowd of performers here. I didn't realize you were as well. Uh, you know, the, the mysteries of trying to. I mean, I, as I said, I started taking notes on my dinner table conversation and, you know, where do you, how do you pin down the butterfly and, and, you know, humor and how come a joke that works 
one night with the same kind of eye, you don't have to go to a different country, suddenly falls flat the next night. Uh, I mean, it, these are, it drove, it drove uh, it's driven a lot of people crazy uh, uh, because we're chasing the unicorn of, uh, of humor. Um, yes, any other, any other uh, questions, comments, or anything uh, from anybody? Um, I'll say, I'll say one more thing about the film itself, since that was kind of what brought us all here together. Um, so as a circus historian, we knew that a film had been made in 1902 in Indianapolis, but it took you to find it. Uh, there's the circuses, uh, at the, the circuses at the time, the circuses at that time would, uh, that time basically would, put uh, together a route, put together a route, a route, a route a a second, history of diary. History of diary. Because for some reason, we're getting a big echo in your sound. So everybody mute their own sound. I'll mute mine as well, because it could, it's, it's Zoom. Um, anyway. Go ahead. OK, so I was just saying thank, thank you for uh, the restoration work that was done on that film. We circus historians have known that there was a film that was made in Indianapolis on, in 1902, thought to be lost. Uh, there, the circuses of that time would put together what was called a route book, which was essentially an annual diary of what had accom been accomplished during that year. And when you take a look at when they were in Indianapolis, it mentions in there that there was a film that was made that was going to be shown in the black tent. Now, the Ringling Circus had a, a you know, you think of these circus tents, they had a sideshow that was called the black tent. And the black tent was a place where, guess what? showed silent films. So the Ringling Circus, again, when I was talking earlier about sort of this uniting thing and bringing new technology, I mean, the first, one of the first automobiles was on the Barnum and Bailey Circus in, in 1896. So the, they, they actually created that film knowing that they were going to show it in the circus tent because we have that record and now we actually have the film. So thank you very, very much. I, I second that and I think we all do. We all know the valuable work that the the, the SNA Silent Film Museum is doing, especially Rena, of course, who is very much a part of it. Um, and also, the, it, when you look at the film, you'll see it preceded by uh, David Keane, in the restoration, uh, doing a wonderful explanation of the deep dive detective work he did to trace the film to, and including he shows in the film, they cut in uh, a picture of the, I forgot the name of the book you were saying, the, the tour book basically. I have a question for, for you, Chris. Um, you are a, a circus historian, and I don't understand, I understand what a historian is, but do you work for, are you a university teacher? Do you work for Ringling's Museum? I'm in broadcasting, uh, but, you know, I kind of divide my time between uh, the news of today and the history of the circus, and I'm not telling you which one that's more interesting to me these days. <laughs> you work on the radio? Station or something, or television station? Yeah, I, I work for a, a big broadcasting company, and I've spent my entire life doing that. So, but um, but I grew up in Sarasota, Florida, which is where the Ringling Circus was based. Uh, my my father was a circus fan, historian type. When I was a kid, I had the opportunity to meet some of these great circus stars of the early 20th century, May Worth and you know Merle Evans, these people who had been involved in the early 1900s. So the fire was lit at that point. They had a museum there at the time called the Circus Hall of Fame. And while other kids were, you know, maybe working at McDonald's, I had a job at the Circus Hall of Fame. So uh, I've been doing it for a long time. Um, uh, the, um, I met a, a, a woman, actually became a good friend, a couple, uh, and the woman grew up in Sarasota, and, and she was a child of the circus, wanted nothing to do with it, became a librarian, um, but her parents were tightrope walkers, and it was scary to her as a, as a kid. I was, early in my career, uh, I, I was doing straight on mime, as I told you, uh, with white makeup, and I was, I'll share this with you, uh, I was in my dentist chair, uh, getting my teeth uh, probed uh, with the, those sharp little needle tools. And the dentist said to me, so Dan, his name was Dr. Coffee. So Dan, how's the mime business? And I said, oh, oh fine, Dr. Coffee. Uh, have you ever seen me perform? He says, no, Dan, I get nauseous when I look at mimes. <laughs> this is not what you want to hear as somebody is poking needle-like things into your gums, into all the sensitive parts. Uh, 
So uh, I just want, I just want by, by way of uh, representing it to the extent I can, my fellow performers out there, which is the majority of you actually, um, uh, we can tell the rest of them that it hasn't been easy. It has, it's, not all, it's not all glitter and tinsel or whatever that expression is. Um, any other thoughts? Any other thoughts that we, that we um, um, anybody wants to share? Yes, Larry, maybe we uh, have some. Could, well, could Chris put his email address on chat? I have a question, but it's not about clowns. It's about the circus itself. So I will. Thanks. And I will, I will encourage anyone to uh, go to circushistory.org, which is the uh, website of the Circus Historical Society. And um, we have, and we also have Facebook groups that, uh, in fact, that's where I found out about today. <laughs> if you put that on the chat, this will be available to people, uh, I believe. Uh, is that true, Rena? Will you make this available to people, the recording of this, or will it be posted? Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. This is the first time I know that anybody could hear. Uh, we'll put it, we can put it in the comments of the, the chat to make sure. But uh, yeah, how that's... Can, how can sure. people access that afterwards or can they not? We'll put it in the comment part. It'll be available. Don't worry. People will be okay. able to get to him until yeah. he tells us to take his email address off. It'll be fine. Uh, but I, I, I do actually have an announcement. I mean, I do want to make an announcement about just things in general. Uh, so what I really appreciate the fact that Chris contacted me uh, and he said, you know, you really should be t having a h historian on board to talk about the circus parade film. And I said, well, actually, we're not really talking about the circus parade film. We're really more talking about circus as an art form and circus and silent films. And, and you guys kind of changed it to talking about performance and, and that, which is totally fine. That's, we have some flexibility in what we do here. Next month though, uh, we are going to have that shift to talking specifically about the circus and the circus that was in 1902 in Indianapolis. And we're gonna go wagon car by wagon car and talk about the different elements of it. And that's what Chris is, he is gathering some historians, uh, some of whom you may have seen on the American Masters Circus Program. I mean, this is going to be a big deal in, in my mind. I know we have a small group here, and I can tell you, based on the momentum, I would have guessed we would add 100 people on this Zoom. So, uh, but things happen. I'm sure everybody was excited about the parade film itself. So we'll have a drill down on the parade specific next month. And then this talk with Jason and Dan and Mr. Chaplin himself uh, talking about um, the, and, and Nigel Dreiner is going to be talking about Limelight and The Circus, both important films that Chaplin uh, was part of, and I'm, that's going to be very, very exciting. So we haven't gotten too deep into the weeds, as it were, talking about silent film and the backdrop of The Circus, um, and I don't know if we have time for that today, um, but next month, not only are we doing Circus, but we're also going to have a focus on Nickelodeon and magic lantern slides. Um, and we've got several other really exciting things coming down the pike, as it were, in the next few months, including a whole uh, program on Reginald Denny. So it's gonna be quite a lot of fun in the next few months. Thank you. Rena, I have to take my hat off to you because I have, you know, we can see you there and I've never seen a ventriloquist who moved their lips less during a speech. That's, you really developed a lot of your innate uh, talents since you've been at the Nile Silent Film Museum, uh, immersed by the imagery of the past greats. I wonder if anybody wants to steer us towards that silent film conversation that Rena was mentioning, by the way, that I had blown this entire panel by not focusing on, and uh, for which I may have called um, But uh, I know that uh, you, you historians particularly um, know a lot more about it. What, what I was going to, what, what I was making notes on about, you know, as I was brainstorming all this with, with my, uh, myself and, and, and the other folks on the panel, uh, it, it struck me, of course, that uh, W.C. Field's first major starring role in a feature, of course, was based on a stage play about the circus called Poppy. And it was directed by, uh, on the film by D.W. Griffith, and ch the name was changed to Sally of the Sawdust, and Fields does very well as a silent comedian. Um, and uh, then in 10 years later or so, 
uh, 11 years later, they revived it as Poppy. Uh, they went back to the original material, completely different film, um, uh, but the same basic plot outline, uh, and uh, I would say a much better film because Fields does is able to do uh, one of the specialty acts that he filled his films with, but that never th does not appear in any other forms. It's one where he's got this ridiculous instrument that he calls the Kadula Kadula, I think, and it's a broom a broom handle with a string on it, sort of like a, a, a cello and a sort of dustpan on the bottom or something. And he's he's he, but he never gets to play it because each time he tilts to play it. His top hat, which is a very tall one, drops onto the floor, and he kicks it away. And I don't know how he did this, but it, it, it makes 360-degree circle. And just as it's, he's about to, to play, it, it, it appears, and he kicks it the other way. And it's just this brilliant, brilliant prop manipulation. He transcended all the differences between juggling, comedy, mime, uh, uh, it, it's it's a beautiful routine, um, and it's a wonderful film. Um, so I wanted to mention that bit of continuity. Um, anybody else? That's not. That's just a bit of silent film. But any some of you probably know a lot more silent films with a circus background than we've talked about. Okay, Bob, you again. Yes, I'm sorry. Just uh, yeah. Well, you know, Fields was a silent humorist, a juggler for forever before he even spoke on stage. So. I think being a silent film comedian wasn't a hard, you know, leap for him. But uh, just talking about the, the hat that he uses in, in Poppy, I work with a clown, um, his name is George Carl, wonderful comedian, George Clown, you, George Carl. Really, I worked with him at the resorts and he had hats that did all these, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Bill Irwin borrowed a lot. And so did, I think David Chida borrowed a lot from him too, but we won't go into that. But, but anyway, he had hats specially made to do those kind of, you know, like he handed me one of his hats and it wasn't a normal hat. It, it was like pulled in a certain way. So it would go around and around or do tricks, right? He's showing you. So uh, Fields was, a, was of that school, of that circus school of knowing how to build those. That hat was built special so that he could hit it with the bow. I think it's a bow of that thing. And it would, you know, go a certain way and slow up and he could, it around so that was uh, that was pure circus on, on fields's part although i don't think fields ever did a circus i know clark and mccullough were in the circus i believe there were implied uh, cook you mentioned there were a lot of guys who had been in circus but uh, definitely that's a circus that's a circus shtick well you know bob stay with with us uh, <laughs> one of the reasons i was pressing ron you ron about uh, uh you know what and some of you others about what happened in that act is that the 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 tantalizing bane of my existence is you read about Buster Keaton's childhood stage act and there are fragments of it in his films that you see especially in one of those Columbia shorts called the taming of the snood of all things which has nothing to do with anything I could tell but it's the knockabout act that he did with his father except it's a woman acrobat doing it with him with where they're throwing each other onto tables and it's it's astonishing um, and uh, uh, you, so, but you read about Keaton's act, and you know I relish what Chaplin did on stage. You read about, you know, what Marceline did. Uh, Chaplin said that he would go fishing uh, on, in the middle of the Hippodrome stage, and it would like five thousand people. And what he would fish for is uh, he'd put he'd he'd bait the hook with a with a necklace, a, di a spangly diamond necklace, and he'd go and and. And, and a chorus girl would come up emerging out of the hole. And then the whole, a whole chorus would come up and the whole thing would transform from uh, the lake scene into this spangled stair kind of thing. And it's the chorus parade. Um, and, uh, you know, and he had this little dog that would do tricks. So what, so my question for you, because, and, and you read about things people did at parties. A friend of mine who's a television producer said Keaton came to the studio. I, I live in Pittsburgh. And he uh, would he would appear on uh, television shows here. He did his thing where he would reach down. He was standing, and he'd reach down and take his ankle, and he'd put one leg onto the table. Then he'd reach down and take the second ankle and put the second damn leg on the table. So he's sitting like here's the table, and he's sitting with his legs uh, and his back complete, and then go crashing down. And he's doing this in his in his mid-60s, and he's in terrible shape, it looks like, and he's 
you know, dying from lung cancer, and, and he did it till the end of his life. And and he did it. He did it in the circus. Uh, late in life, it's one of the jobs he could get. He went to the what was it, Cirque Medrano. Cirque and, Medrano. Yeah. So Cirque my Medrano. question for you, because I relish these these tantalizing accounts. That one we know what happened, but Chaplin did all kinds of things at parties we don't know. Uh, you know, people allude to them because some kind because of, some of them were blue. Uh, uh, routines. They were a little risque. Um, what did you do in the act with George Carl? I've been looking at him for years. The, the videos I can find. Um, what was your part in this thing? I didn't. I didn't. I, I shouldn't say that. I, wor I worked. I worked with him. He, tandem, but what he, was did, your... he did a single. George Carl did a single. I know. I know. But I, I, I was doing W.C. Fields. There was a, a. It was Merv Griffin's Resorts, and Merv was alive, and I played W.C. Fields. We had a whole show with imitators, but George Carl did this did the specialty act. It was just him. He spent, yeah. I don't know, five or six minutes just trying to talk on the microphone. He did brilliant stuff all in one. And he walked around and he got smaller and smaller yeah. as he exited, which um I saw Chas Chase do in Sugar Babies when I was a kid. He did the same thing, Chas Chase, who used to eat things. He would eat for eight minutes. He would tear his shirt front and he would eat it. He would but Chaz Chase did the same thing, walking around, getting smaller and walking out. And when I mentioned to George Carl, I saw Chaz Chase do that. George didn't want to discuss it. So I don't know, I don't know who did it first. But, well, you know, George worked by himself. Nobody worked with, with George Carl. I will tell you, I took George Carl to see Charlie Callis at Trump's castle together. And sitting with George Carl watching Charlie Callis was like, a, a, a Fellini dream, you know, <laughs> it was really, and he, he was in awe of Charlie Campus, George Paul. It was very interesting how he was watching him and, and nodding instead of who's, laughing. Who's he was Charlie Callis. Could you tell us who Charlie Callis is? Oh, you don't know Charlie, who doesn't know Charlie Callis? Nope. Oh, he's a very famous, he was a very famous comedian. Um, he's in a Jerry Lewis movie, like The Big Mouth. Uh, you can look him up on YouTube. He was a brilliant physical a comedian, he would do weird things, make, you know, the <laughs> it, it was a very strange uh, comic, but he was very funny. Charlie Callis, look him up. Yeah. Very skinny, Van Dyke lines. Skinny and, you know, kind of, yeah, <laughs> hard to explain Charlie Callis. <laughs> he would do very strange uh, routines. <laughs> Ron's well, doing Charlie Callis above you, so it's really oh, funny. Okay, I can't, I can't, he would do a thing like he was a hunter in the way he would shoot, shoot. it was very funny. Yeah, and, and, and he, had, he had sound effects. He was very, I guess he was like Rowan Atkinson before Rowan Atkinson. He was that type, I would guess. He said. And no relation to Maria, I presume. What's that? No relation to Maria. No, no, no. no. I don't think Charlie, what show? I don't think Charlie sang, no. I think I, I'm remembering him. The uh, the thing I wanted to bring to your attention too, and I'll, I'll bow out, um, is, uh, that uh, Tati, many of you will know Tati's work, in my opinion, the only filmmaker who really took the silent film vision and had his own original contemporary sound vision, but it was really a silent movie vision in the, in the sound world successfully, along with W.C. Fields and Laurel and Hardy, who also did it, but they were done by the 50s when, when Tati began working. And his last film, he made uh, about only about five films over a period of 25 years. And then he made a, a sixth, which was uh, nobody, he'd lost his fortune because he'd bet it on his last film, which lost money, um, which was called uh, uh, Playtime. Um, and then he got somehow this Swedish television to sponsor one last film. And he, he found a hippie circus uh, at, to work in. And the film is not very good in terms of all the, all the surround of it, but he's playing one of the performers and he does his old stage numbers, which made him famous. And they're all mime numbers dealing with sports, like a, a tennis player or a, a man riding a horse where he's both the horseman and the horse. And he's very old and his body is a little creaky from accidents that he'd had, but they're wonderful. And so that's worth looking up um, for those of you who are, who are immersed in this field. Um, I also want to, um, I want to give a little button to this by doing two things. One of them is, uh, Ron and I were talking about E.E. Um, e. Cummings' poem about the circus, 
which you somebody mentioned was one of their inspirations seeing this this sort of slogan about the circus the first line of it is uh damn everything but the circus which i thought was a poem of ee e. cummings it's actually from ron told me what what is it from ron you you have to unmute yourself It's from a surrealist play uh, called He. Could you could you re could you read those lines? Because it it became a kind of a, a a woman named Sister Corita took that line and made it into an art artistic um, thing that was reproduced a million places. Damn everything but the circus that you would see on people's walls uh, in the nineteen sixties and seventies. Yeah, I, I there was a framed version of it at Teatro Zanzani. That's the first time I saw it. Uh, you have to imagine, I guess, everything being in lowercase, it being <laughs> E. Cummings. Damn everything but the circus. Damn everything that is grim, dull, motionless, unrisking, inward turning. Damn everything that won't get into the circle, that won't enjoy, that won't throw its heart into the tension, surprise, fear and delight of the circus, the round world, the full existence. Something like that. Thank you, Ron. That was lovely. Um, I, I, wanna, um, I wanna end by uh, asking, uh, a couple of us have, have put our own uh, in costume characters as our profile picture on Zoom. Um, and why don't we pop, pop those on so the others can can see. Um, Jason, did you have one and you have one, Ron? You just mute yeah. your video. Not and... my video, so you see. That. That's my head. Is anybody's coming through? Or did you? Uh, I see. I see Jason's. Yeah. Okay. And yes, Ron's crazy, crazy king. I don't see them, but I wanted to thank everybody who is involved with this because that we changed direction on how what we were doing with the Zoom because we had the opportunity to have the king of the clowns here. We have, I, I mean, which is amazing. And Mr. Towson, an author about clowns. I mean, this just, this is an exciting, exciting program for me. And I do want to thank everybody. And it's okay that we shift and change course because of the wonderful opportunities we had and the people who came. I really appreciate you gentlemen all taking your time to be here. One, one last thing, I, if you Thank if you. A button, you have to, if, to see our thumbnails, um, you have to, when you hit the view thing, it'll give you a menu choice of show non-video uh, speakers, uh, which would normally be a gray if they, those of you who are on like uh, uh, Michael Aus and Joel Hooks, you can see a gray screen. But then you'll see everybody's and you'll see um, um, Ron's and Jason's and my uh, uh, thumbnails. And I would like to just say uh, that how touched I am. It's very rare for me, uh, yeah, I see yours, Jason, to, uh, to be able to talk with my colleagues uh, this way. And also you experts, it turns out everybody in the audience is an expert and a or a practitioner. And it's, it's very touching. Uh, I would just like to say, um, a, a warm thank you to all of you and uh trial version <laughs> thank you it's been very moving trial version trial version <laughs> who's well, who's saying trial version trial who's version saying? might be the trial version of someone's uh, zoom or you, uh, maybe your zoom uh, uh, time is up Oh, the trial version of Zoom that you exceeded the time limit. Larry is, Larry is paying for it. I think otherwise we would have been cut off long ago. <laughs> been going about this is the amount of time we wanted it to go about ninety minutes or or so. Thank you all for the lovely conversation, and thank, thank you, you Diane. for hosting. And uh, hope to see you all again soon. And I feel like I've made some new friends here tonight that I'll be following up on. Likewise. Thanks, everybody. Keep on smiling. Keep smiling. <laughs>